Hey, good morning. Welcome to Celebration Church Pleasant Park. Uh, we are happy to be here. We have been talking this morning and praying this morning about how special it feels to, uh, to, to sing the kinds of songs that we get to sing, to be united in the Word and united in the Spirit of God. Uh, so I am Pastor Jason, and uh, this is Gina and Drew and David. You may not know some of these folks. Uh, for, for a couple of them, this is their first time joining us in the building to help lead you in music uh, since the pandemic has started. And so it's kind of fun to vary things up a little bit. And uh, so we're glad to be here. Um, I will be honest with you in the choosing of songs for today. Uh, I waffled back and forth a lot. I know that over the last two, two and a half weeks, there have been seeming waves of bad news for a lot of the people that make up our church family. Uh, a lot of people are struggling with some different things, and some of it was kind of foreseeable. Uh, some of it was quite sudden. And right now, I know that there are people in our church family standing in the gap uh, for other people. Uh, connected to our church family, um, and that's just not easy, and it's not necessarily supposed to be, but uh, anyway, so as as I kind of have these touch points, and uh, even in my own life and heart, there were some hard things, and uh, I kind of waffled on like, man, do we just lean into this like somber meditative thing, or do we come and declare uh, and uh, we <laughs> chose songs for both and then kind of changed and then changed back and then changed back again. Uh, but all of that is to say that we're going to start off with a fairly well-known up-tempo song. And if you are coming in sorrow, uh, understand that uh, it is not the end and that there is joy to be had and that the grace of our good God um, is abundant um, and it's not something that you need to worry about deserving or earning, uh, that it is amazing, it is free, uh, and it is enough. And His mercy, it's new every morning, and it's always there. Like, it, even though it's refreshed in the morning, it doesn't mean that it's absent from the night. Uh, and if you, are, if you are feeling joyful, uh, then let your joy prompt a praise uh, and a prayer for those who maybe aren't. And so wherever you are, whatever you're doing, uh, I encourage you to listen closely, uh, not just to us, but listen to what God might be uh, calling you to think and to think, uh, pray and to meditate on uh, even as you sing. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos, only God? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations. With truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. We need you, God. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would 
take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Now we're going to sing a praise. It's a declaration that comes straight from the Bible. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Sing it again. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me. Amen. Well, I invite you to pray with me. Uh, Father, there is no other hope in heaven or on earth that could anchor a faith uh, that can bridge uh, the difficulties in our lives, the, the sorrows and the joys that can explain uh, the, the good and the bad and to give us the hope for anything better. Uh, God, you are the one who defines the best way. And when we, when we are off the mark, uh, Father, we feel it. And so I pray that you would help every uh, person um, on the planet, if possible, if at all possible. Help them feel that gap. Help them search. And God, put somebody in their path to tell them about Jesus. Jesus, thank you for being the one who sets us free, who, who makes up the gap, who centers us back where it is that we ought to be, and not because of anything that we have done, uh, but because of what you did, that by faith that we can be saved. Thank you. You are the one who was slain for us, and as morbid and as strange as that is in our day, we understand the idea of, of a substitute. We understand the idea of, uh, of a ransom. And so I pray that you would help us understand more about the grace that you have given. Amen. Amen. Well, I have some announcements for you. And the first one right up front, this is the third announcement of bands. The first publication of bands uh, was uh, a few weeks ago and then a second. And now the third one means that uh, Skylar Shop and Jenny Murray are going to be married. And if you have any reason why you don't think that that should be the case, then you're, it's on you to contact us. But we are really excited to celebrate that with them, uh, to champion what God is doing in them. Uh, and so that's special. Uh, so that is, that is the big announcement. Other than that, we are a church family who wants to celebrate the greatness of God by knowing Jesus and by making him known to all peoples. And we want to do that by seeing, being, and giving, and going to the glory of God. For us, that means seeing is looking at Jesus. That's why we sing so much and why we explore the Bible to see how it, uh, how it reveals him. And then B means look like Jesus because we believe that God's spirit and his word shapes us to be like uh, the one who we sing about, who is so amazing, who has given such grace, who has paid such a price for us. And then because of that, out of the well of that work and the goodness, then it springs forth in giving, which is loving others like Jesus, and going, which is to lead people to uh, Jesus. So that's kind of the scope of what we try to accomplish with our church. And so all of our programming, all of the resources that we share, the way we partner with other churches in our city uh, and around the country and the world uh, are, are to that end. And we want to invite you to join us. 
Like we, wherever it is that you are in your journey of faith, we feel like there is a place for you. We are all people in process, and we want to help one another uh, pursue God in that way. So to connect with us, you can find us obviously on social media. If you're watching this on YouTube, you have found us in some sort. And so info at celebrationchurch.ca. Prayer at celebrationchurch.c are two key emails uh, that you can contact to be uh, in touch with us with any questions or comments or needs, uh, and we will do uh, our best. So also on the website, if you are interested in giving to the work uh, through Celebration Church, you'll see a giving tab, and it has information there on that. Um, But with that said, uh, I'm going to pray for us once again. I'm going to make sure... Nope. Ever so often, my phone buzzes me in the middle of a sermon or a service, and I always panic, like the mic's not working or the stream fell. We had thunderstorms in Ottawa this morning, and so uh, lights were out all over the place on my drive-in. So uh, who knows? We may even drop this, and you might tune in later. But all of that is to say, um, we do this live, if you can't tell, and we love that because we just want to be real. Um, So we're going to pray again, and then... Uh, Gina's going to lead us in an ancient song to help us kind of center. So we've kind of, we've visited the highs uh, with uh, amazing grace. And now we're going to pray that God would give us eyes to see the things that matter, even in the dark places. So uh, Jesus, we gather uh, here in this building. We gather in homes uh, spread out across distance and time. um, And and yet we gather to a sacred moment uh, because like Moses in the burning bush, Um, God, your presence is a consuming fire, Um, and yet it is never, um, never changing, and though you invite us to abide with you, you do not completely consume us, that we, we can be with you. A couple weeks ago, we sang about abiding in you, and so we pray that you would lead us into that place, Uh, help us, help us abide Um, Help us feel your goodness to us and your good leadership of us. Amen. And I was wrong about which song came next. So see, I told you we'd do this live. Uh, So actually the next song will be new for some of you um, and is a wonderful uh, celebration of the mercy of God. So with a really awkward intro, Sing with us. Thy mercy, my God, is the theme of my song, the joy of my heart and the boast of my tongue. Thy free grace alone from the first to the last Hath won my affections and bound my soul fast Without thy sweet mercies I could not live here Sin would reduce me to utter despair But through thy free goodness my spirit's revived And he that first made me still keeps me alive Hallelujah Thy mercy is more than a match for my heart which wonders to feel its own hardness depart dissolved by thy goodness i fall to the ground and weep for the praises mercy i found goodness I own in covenant love with thy crucified son all praise to the spirit whose whisper divine seals of mercy and pardon righteousness of mine all praise to the spirit whose whisper divine 
the seals of mercy and pardon and righteousness of mine. for that promise as we prepare to hear a word that you will never leave you will never forsake and that fills us with a confidence prepare our hearts to believe it you give life No. 
We often need you to guide us into the place of believing it, but you are great. God of creation, glory that shakes the foundations of the earth, that led your people out of bondage, that called your people out of nothing to be a people, that translated your goodness and what it means to be your people from a physical thing to a spiritual thing, so that those of us that did not originate as Jewish, God, that we can still be your people because you are calling all nations, all peoples, all language groups. God, you are, you are calling sons and daughters from afar to be for the praise of your glory. And so thank you that we can have faith that you are great and that you have a word prepared for us this morning. And so fill Josh's mind, fill his heart as he comes to speak um, God, that the words that are of him and not of you, that they would fall away, uh, and that your spirit would inspire a special listening for the rest of us, that we would hear what it is that you're saying through your word and through the way that he has prepared alongside you uh, to deliver this message. In your name we pray, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, really good to be here with you this morning. I'm very excited uh, to be able to preach, for Jason to give me the opportunity, and 
He has introduced us a little bit, me and my wife, Gina. That was her singing right here. Um, we were going to do a duet, but I don't sing. So there's that. Um, but we are excited because we have recently been married and we're back here in Ottawa. I'm from Ottawa and we're looking to make Celebration Church our home church. So we're excited to continue to get to know you guys. We've been able to be on some of the e-parlors and meet a lot of you, but I'm sure there's a lot more of you that we get to meet um, a little bit more about my wife and I and, and an introduction. We have been married for about four and a half months, and that's uh, pretty much the only important thing to me. So you can, if you want to know more, you can ask her, and uh, we'll continue to get to know you guys. So the passage that we are in today is Hebrews 13, 1 to 6. And leading up to this passage, we've been unpacking the idea and using the language that Jason used last week, the idea of going from right knowing to right doing. So our, our holiness, our ability to love, our righteousness, it all rests on the deep theological truths and promises that we've been unpacking for a while now in the book of Hebrews, and specifically Two weeks ago, when Diolo was preaching, he set us up well for uh, the last two verses that lead into what I'm going to be talking about today, which is chapter 12, verses 28 and 29, that says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Verse 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. And Diolo's version of the scriptures says, uses the word worship. Let us worship God acceptably. My version says serve, but I think we can think of those interchangeably as we receive from God. And so we are expressing a thankfulness in service and worship to him in reverence and awe. And it's kind of the very last verse is this big crescendo of all of the theological truth that has been unpacked into our God as a consuming fire. And, you know, we have this intimidating, this fear-inducing being that we know as God on our side. And so we get up to uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 6. And in light of all of that, we look at what does it actually look like to live in light of who our God is, who we worship, who we know. And, you know, what does that look like practically? So our passage today, I'm going to go ahead and read it in full. Chapter 13, verses 1 to 6. It says, Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And in this passage, we can see and what we'll unpack is that verse 1, 2, 3, 4, and the first bit of verse 5 is rooted in the promise, in, in the truth of 5 and 6. So in light of 5 and 6, we understand what it looks like to live practically. And the big idea that we'll be unpacking from this pas passage today is that our expression of service that we see in verse 1 to 5 are all based on our fear of God that is developed through our faith in the promise which leads us to live bold lives, not fearing man or fearless of man, that will result in non-believers seeing our actions and glorifying our Heavenly Father. So this idea of, of knowledge, of truth, moving to our faith in that truth, moving to action and service to God, is we can see from the very words of Jesus in Matthew 5, 14 and 16, he helps us understand kind of the why or the purpose of, of our lives. And he says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your heavenly father. So the idea 
here and from Jesus and, and this passage and the book of Hebrews is that we are on this mountain, which is God, the theological truths, the promises, who we know God to be. And our, our knowledge of that is the beginning. Our faith in that is how we exercise it and become to, and come to believe it. And then that will lead to our good works, our light that shines before others so that other people can see God and glorify him. Other people, they don't see our knowledge. They don't respect or think of God. If we can throw around cool theological terms, they see God when we actually live our lives in a way, in, in a submitted way to him, in service to him and in love. And we'll continue to unpack this as we go further. So we're talking about right knowing and how it leads to right doing. We see that in Matthew 5 from Jesus. And now let's, let's kind of dig in here and see how this gets unpacked in, in our passage here in Hebrews and how our faith in God will produce holy living. So verse, the end of verse 5 and verse 6 is where, is where we see the, the truths. And it says, Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So I wanted to to unpack this idea a little bit of beginning with truth. So we begin with the truth and we base our lives on that is the right knowing. And then, you know, we've been, we've been focusing on that a lot in Hebrews and it's followed by believing that truth. And that's what the book of Hebrews specifically calls faith, that we start with truth, we believe the truth, we, we exercise our faith. We see in Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And in uh, a couple of verses later in 11.6, it says, whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So our faith looks like holding on to and having a developing a deep conviction of the promises of God that come from the word of God based on the word of God. And so the, to pursue faith and truth, we have to do two things. And this is what Jason mentioned last week. He said to kind of develop our faith and pursue that faith in, in truth He said, we need the Holy Spirit's enlightenment of the Bible to really get it. And so two things that we see that we need there is we need to have the Bible. We need the word of God. And we also need to have the Spirit's enlightening of the word of God. We need to have the Spirit in us. And with these two elements, we can actually exercise our faith. And our faith can lead us then to be utterly convinced that God is with us and convinced that he will reward us. And so we work to develop this conviction of what is not seen, the unseen. We, we work and develop in our faith in, in the word of God to be more convinced of those things that we can't see with our eyes, but we know them to be true because of what God has said. And from exercising our faith, it begins to transform our living. So the more that we apprehend the truth, the more that we exercise our faith, the scripture says in verse five there, the more contentment we will find. And we could use maybe a couple different words to expand our understanding of that. It uses the word contentment. It might be helpful to think of it as our joy or satisfaction that our, and, and we find our contentment, joy or satisfaction on the unwavering promises of God. And it's based on the promise here that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And that leads to verse six, which says, I will confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. And in light of this passage, in light of the idea of of truth, exercising faith, leading to contentment, what, it might be helpful to ask the question, what can man do to us? And thinking of that in, in the context of this passage, in light of it, 
Our Christian brothers from verse 1 and sisters, they could be manipulative. There, there can be backstabbing going on. They can shame us for different things. Living in community, we can all be aware of, of the sin that, that affects us, the way that we treat one another. When it comes to verse 2, the idea of, of how we treat strangers, strangers can be dangerous. It can be uncomfortable. It can be, you know, they're, they're untrustworthy or they might just be, we, we don't want to be around them. The idea of taking care of prisoners and the mistreated, we already saw in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34, a couple weeks ago, that the believers, they, their stuff was plundered. Their, their belongings were taken from them and destroyed. And it was during a time that they were actually going to visit a prisoner. They went from their homes to the prison And while they were there, their stuff was either taken or destroyed. And and then marriage. Marriage can be tough. It can seem at times like it's not worth it, unprofitable. The way that we treat each other in marriage can sometimes seem like the the purpose of it is not good. So in, in in light of coming to the point where we can say, I will basically not fear men, what can they do to me? We understand that there's very real things that they can do to us. But in the midst of Christian life, in the midst of the way that sin affects us, the way that we treat one another, there comes faith. And faith in the truth says your contentment and your joy, your satisfaction is not found in your circumstances and what's in front of you in the seen. It's found in the unseen. It's found in the unwavering presence of God with us. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The following verse, verse 6, it quotes Psalm 118. And the very following verse in Psalm 118, Psalm 118, 118.7, it goes from, I will, I will not fear for what can, God, or what can man do to me. And then he says, the Lord is for me. And so we're able to take the comfort in our faith, we're able to take the comfort of God's presence into every context of our lives, into every relationship that we have. And we'll unpack this further about how, it lo- how we can think about uh, each of these verses. But I just wanted to share uh, this idea of God being with us. And it, it brings the idea of, and it, and it is the reality of an ever-present father. And uh, I just wanted to share kind of a, an illustration of how it might affect our lives in such a way that um, my own father was in the military for, for many years and he would come home, uh, off the, get off the bus and walk home. And we kind of joke about it now, but when we were kids, he would wear his full uh, military outfit, his camo, and he would look like, you know, as a kid, it's like he's like a Navy SEAL or something. And when our father came home in his military outfit, when we were kids, we would not be afraid of anyone on the neighbor, in the neighborhood. You know, we might have um, done something to make somebody upset or, or whatever, whether it be a child or a parent, you know, when you're kids and kind of messing around. And uh, if our dad was there with us, we, we no longer feared those people because we knew that everyone was afraid, in some sense, of our father dressed in this military outfit. And so, you know, we didn't worry about other people coming to, to mess with us because our father is right there with us, next to us. And we actually feared him probably more than the people around us. And that's the, the very idea of what apprehending the truth and then believing and having faith in it is being convinced that we have a heavenly father with us who we're a little bit more afraid of him because he's a consuming fire and we don't have to worry about what can happen and what men really can do to us. And so, what does it look like to live a life of faith-driven contentment in the Lord? The writer of Hebrews says it looks like loving our Christian brothers and sisters, loving strangers, showing hospitality to strangers, remembering and loving the Christian brothers and sisters that are mistreated and are in prison, and holding marriage in high honor. And so the very first Verse says, 
Let brotherly love continue. So our faith in God leads us to brotherly love. When we are exercising our faith, fearing God, not fearing man, finding our contentment, our joy in him, we no longer have to live our lives based on the acceptance of the people that are around us and our Christian brothers and sisters. We no longer have to manipulate others to get what we want. We don't have to use people. Our faith moves us to be in relationship with one another for the other person's sake. It allows us to enter into a room and think more of how we can love and serve the other people than how they can meet our needs or how we can feel like they appreciate us for who we are because we are accepted and loved and fully satisfied in God, knowing that he is there with us. Hebrews 10, 22 to 25, read a couple verses from there. It says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. So we come together as a body, as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we do good to one another. We even encourage one another not to sin. And we help one another, especially, we see this as well in Hebrews chapter 3, the idea of helping one another not to sin, but to apprehend the promises of God, to exercise their faith. When a brother or sister is lacking in faith, we come alongside them and we help them with our faith. We point them to the truth. And we do all of this because we're not seeking approval of others. We're not worried about offending them. We've already been approved and accepted in God. And we know where true contentment, joy, and satisfaction comes from. And we can lead others to that true joy in Christ. And we know that it comes through faith in God. And it was Jesus as well that said, in John 13, 35, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So we are set free from trying to earn the acceptance of our Christian brothers and sisters because we know what we have in Christ, in God, in his presence with us. And the love that we have for one another that we can then express in communion is what glorifies God and what allows other people to see in us, in the relationship that we have, a heavenly father and the love that comes from him. The second verse says, our, it says, do not forget to entertain strangers, that our faith in God also moves us to show hospitality to strangers. The term hospitality in maybe specifically North America seems to have the meaning of having people into your home for a meal or the idea of maybe, speci maybe more specifically loving our, our friends or the people that we know and, and, and having them over. But the actual meaning of the word hospitality is love to strangers, love for them, showing love to those who are not like us, who are different. And so the writer is pointing out, the writer of Hebrews, that love begins with the brethren and it continues to those who aren't like us, those who are not believers, those who are foreigners. And the connection of loving strangers with the connection with faith is made in the second half of the verse that says, we see the second half, it points to, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now the Jewish, the primary, primarily Jewish audience would be well aware that Abraham had entertained angels when he showed hospitality to them in Genesis 18. Lot did as well in Genesis 19 and Gideon in Judges 6 as some examples. And in the example in Genesis 19, Abraham, he was rewarded for his faith, for doing what he did. There was a special blessing because of his hospitality. So the writer is communicating to the audience that we too, or they too, 
can receive a special blessing through the expression of hospitality, through our love to those who are not like us. And as a New Testament believer, now in our day, we can look to that and we can also look to Matthew 25, where we can see from, the, from a story from Jesus about the sheep and the goats, the sheep being the believers who have eternal life, who have eternal rewards in heaven and how they obtain these spiritual blessings. In Matthew 25, 35, he says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And they ask him, when Lord did we do this for you? And Jesus' response to them was, I tell you the truth, whatever you do, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And so from where we stand now, we can understand that when we minister to the, these people, when we minister to those who are not like us, who are different from us, we can receive spiritual blessing and even minister to God himself. So is it a risk to love the stranger? I think we can say sometimes, yes, it can be a risk to go out of our comfort zone to do that. It's sometimes very far outside of our comfort zone. And it's, it's not usually easy to do. Nothing about it is easy But we know and we stand on the promise and the truth that God is with us, that God will never leave us, that he's always there. And we stand on the promise that he's a rewarder of those who serve him in this way. So we can understand that showing hospitality, showing this love to strangers is something that we do because God first loved us and there will be unknown spiritual blessing. We don't know exactly what that will be, but there's a rewarder. He diligently, he rewards those who diligently seek him. And that brings us up to verse three that says, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are also in the body. Our faith will move us to care for prisoners and the mistreated. Now, these, uh, these prisoners were evidently Christians who were suffering specifically because of their faith. The mistreated were uh, specifically treated because they were Christians, because their faith in God. They were being uh, abused. They were being potentially tortured and in prison and losing their stuff. And in this time, the reality of prison for the Roman empire was, was nothing like it was today. And even for many of the prisoners, they had to rely on support from people outside of their prison, their Christian brothers and sisters, their friends, their family to even eat a meal, to have their, their basic necessities met. And this was also a time when Emperor Nero had set Rome on fire and blamed it on the Christians. So, the, the weight of this verse is, it, it's heavy. It's, it's not a, a, a light thing to say. And in light of, I had mentioned ch- in chapter 10, verse 32 and 33, we see that, you know, th- so there's those in prison, but then there's those who actually went to the prison to meet the needs of those people in prison, their Christian brothers and sisters, and their stuff was destroyed. Their stuff was stolen and plundered. And so, Everyone at this time is in danger and you know, nobody is safe. And yet at that point, this verse is written in light of, and what we understand is that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. The writer is trying to convince the Jewish audience that what they have in Christ is far better than anything else on earth, that the value of loving their, the prisoners, loving those, and, and not being afraid of losing all of their stuff when they're going to visit people in prison, the value of that is be, it comes in the promise that there are better possessions to come, 
that there is total freedom in Christ. That there, you know, whether they are a prisoner or have nothing because it's been taken from them, that in Christ they have everything. That God is with them and that their rewards, their spiritual blessing comes in eternity regardless of what happens here. So our faith causes us to not find contentment in our own personal safety or our material possessions, but in the very promises of God. One of the most practical applications that I think of when it comes to this idea of, of how we treat prisoners and those who are mistreated, I think specifically because of the context that we're in, it can be, at least for me, it was difficult to think, okay, how do I, how do I apply this first? I don't know very many people that are persecuted. Pers- I personally, I don't know them. Um, I don't know in North America, there's not a ton of persecution at this point. And I was talking with a missionary friend a couple weeks ago and without asking him or him knowing that I was going to be uh, preaching on, on Hebrews, he brought up and mentioned that in North America, we, we live in kind of a bubble. Our, our Christianity, our Christian experience is a little bit different than for the reality of most Christians in the world. And it can be very easy to become disheartened at little things or neglect our faith because there's not a lot. We're, we're not holding on to, or maybe we don't feel like we need to hold on to the promises of God because we don't feel like we're going to lose all of our stuff in our lives in an instant. And he said for him, one of the things that he does is he subscribes to the magazine of the Voice of Martyrs. And the Voice of Martyrs was started by a guy who went through, I think, 14 years of persecution and uh, came because of his faith, came out on the other side, was reunited with his wife, and then started a ministry of telling the stories of believers around the world who are persecuted for their faith. And that challenged me. And so I decided to try and uh, download the app. And me and my wife have been recently uh, trying to implement a habit of praying for and, and bringing awareness of the reality of believers around the world. And I'll just share with you guys, the first time I opened up the app, the person to pray for and the story to inspire was the, the person to pray for was a family in North Africa whose house had just been burned down by Muslims because they refused to deny their faith. And the story to, of inspiration was a man who apprehending the truth, exercising his faith in the promises of God, understanding that God is with him, that the, re- the reward is waiting for him, decided to give up his freedom inspired by Jesus Christ and the gospels, sold himself into slavery and began to work alongside slaves to share the love of Jesus Christ with them. And that challenged me. And I hope that is something that we can make a habit of. There are certainly ways to implement this verse into uh, the context of, of North America. But I think one of the important things that we can do is realize that there are many believers around the world suffering for their faith and we have the opportunity to pray for them. And I even think that this connects back to the idea of verse one of letting brotherly love continue where we come together for the purpose of stirring up love and good works. Because when we remember the mistreated, we hear their stories and we pray for them. We can be reminded by their example of all of what God has done, that the creator God of the universe is with us as he is with them. And we can focus on how everything worthwhile, all the rewards that God has promised are in the future, are to come. And it inspires us to not live a, a mundane life that does, not, that, that does not express itself out in service to God. And that brings up to the fourth verse here in, that talks about marriage. And the fourth way that our, our faith in God affects our lives is where it says, 
let marriage be held in high honor or high esteem. And so we have been looking at verse 1, 2, and 3, the love of the fellow believer, love of the stranger, the hospitality of the stranger, the loving of the stranger, loving prisoners and, and taking care of those who are prisoners and mistreated. And then comes this verse about honoring marriage and also keeping the marriage bed pure, undefiling it. And then it goes on to say that fornicators and adulterers will be judged. And the idea of holding marriage in honor, it becomes a very countercultural thing that we can, uh, based on our, on our faith in God, that we can express. And I want to share a little bit about the, the meaning of marriage or, or the idea behind this verse. It says that the word honor is more uh, commonly used as precious in the New Testament. It's the word used in 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul speaks of gold, silver, and precious stones. It's used in 1 Peter 1 in reference to the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And it's used in 2 Peter 1 when it refers to the precious and very great promises of God. And so what Hebrews 13.4 is saying, in, in when it says, let marriage be held in honor among all, is think of it as this precious thing. When we think of gold and silver and precious stones right there with it, the value that we place on those things, the value with the promises of God, we should think of the value of marriage. It is to be treasured. It's not something to be handled casually or treated commonly. In God's eyes, Marriage is precious, and therefore he says, let marriage be held in honor among all. Let it be thought of and treated as a treasured thing, as a precious thing. And I wanted to share with you, just in light of the idea of, of what we think about marriage, how we approach marriage, and specifically in this passage, John Piper's definition of marriage. He says, marriage is created and defined by God in the scriptures as the sexual and covenantal union of a man and a woman and lifelong allegiance to each other alone as husband and wife with a view of displaying Christ's covenant relationship to his blood-bought church. And so right there in that definition, we can understand the idea of why and in the biblical definition of what marriage is, the purpose that it serves, why it's to be thought of as precious. You know, I shared in First Peter 1, the idea of Jesus' blood referred to as precious, and we understand that, that the purpose of marriage is to display the gospel, to display what God has done for us. And his submitting and, and leadership of the church, dying for the church, serving, for, serving the church. And so understanding the beauty of marriage and even the sexual relationship and how it relates to um, God's character from a biblical definition of marriage and, and the purpose of, of, of our, now that we're in the church age and what that means for a man and a wife and how they relate to each other. We can honor marriage in two primary ways, I would say. One of them being as a single person and the other one as a married person. As a single person, the first way is the idea of of being sexually pure, of keeping ourselves chaste in marriage. That we can, when we think of marriage as being precious and something to be desired and, and looked to as, uh, as something that, that we can do and glorify God in that, it is done and God is glorified the most when we keep ourselves pure. And also the idea of desiring in general to actually get married. It's not something that every person has to do or every person is called to do. But it's certainly something that we're losing in our culture, just the, even the desire to get married. The, the underlying idea of the purpose of marriage in our culture is to get something from someone else, that you only stay together as long as they fulfill your desires, as long as they serve the purpose of meeting your needs. And the moment that that is 
done or the conflict arises and your needs are not being met, you move on. But we understand, and, and I'll talk about it in a, in a second as well, that, that uh, our needs are met in Christ. And so without the, we don't get into a marriage relationship for the purpose of being satisfied. We go into marriage realizing our satisfaction comes from Christ and God and the presence of God in our lives. And then we go into marriage to fulfill the very purpose of what God has outlined in his scripture. As a married person, sexual purity as well, remaining faithfully committed to your spouse. The idea of God judges the sexually immoral, the fornicators, that sexually, satisfying yourself sexually outside of the bounds of, of marriage is, is displeasing to God. And the other way, as a married person, keeping the mission at the center of your marriage is how we can honor marriage and, and think of it as precious, that we're not just two people cohabiting together for the purpose of taking our kids to practices and making money and these kind of things that the, the underlying reason that two people come together to marry is for God's glory to display Christ's love for the church and to lose that as the, as the driving force, as the, the mission statement for your marriage is to not think of it in the way that we're being called to think of it uh, by, the, by the author here in Hebrews. And so, again, regarding marriage and, and our sexuality, or maybe most importantly, we lay hold of God's promises. The, again, the second half of the verse warns against any kind of sexual immorality and how we fight against the sexual sin is in the eternal, unchanging, fully satisfying God that is with us. The, the way that we hold marriage in high honor and think of it as precious and at the same time do not satisfy our sexual desires outside of the purpose of what God has laid in his scriptures is that we no longer look to other people to meet our needs, to meet our needs of love, of connection, of acceptance, that we get to experience all of those things in relationship with others, but we will never be satisfied if we're not first satisfied in God and his presence with us and his promises. And so only when we find our commitment in that which is unchanging will we actually be able to go on loving those people who are flawed in marriage and remember the purpose of it. And whether we are single or married, only we will focus on the desirability of chastity and, and the desirability of our marriage, we'll be able to focus on those things when the desirability is ultimately in pleasing a God, in, in our service to God first. So let us lay hold of the promises of God, thinking of marriage as precious to be sought after and value keeping ourselves pure knowing that our satisfaction comes in God and that is how we get to serve our holy God and display him and allow other people to see the light that shines from our pure, holy lives and our, and our marriages that are serving this purpose. And that comes up to verse five that says, keep your life free from the love of money, that our faith in God leads us to not love money, only when our faith in God and our contentment is found in his presence will we actually be free from the love of money. Without contentment in God, we'll be seeking to find our contentment in our finances. We'll be seeking to find our contentment by having material possession, buying things, trying to buy countless amounts of insurance to make sure that we are safe in every way, shape, and form, that if anything goes wrong, that our money is our savior, and it, it kind of pushes our faith in God to the side. And when we do not trust 
in the promises of God, that it opens the door for the love of money and that opens the door for many other sins that come after it. And it opens the door for feeling anxious and insecure. And in that insecurity, when, when our security is not in God, we try to find our security in money and, and we are susceptible to this idea that money can actually satisfy us and buy that sense of security and peace that we desire. And it also connects to the idea of what we were just talking about with sexual sin, that without our, our satisfaction, our security in God, we will seek not only the, the money, but we'll also seek a sense of fulfillment, intimacy, and connection in these sinful ways outside of what God desires for us. And if we have our faith in the promises, as in verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you, then we will be free from all of the anxiety and insecurity that craves more, that constantly desires more, the endless pit inside of us that will seek to, to bring together material possessions to find our comfort in that. And so looking back over this text and the promises that we have and in, in we began with right knowing, knowing the truth of God, knowing the truth of his promises, knowing the truth of God's unfailing help and fellowship. That promise was taken from Deuteronomy 31.6 that says, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or, dread, or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes on with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. So that is the promise that we see in this passage that we get to root our faith in that will spill into our life of service. And so the writer of Hebrews in this passage is specifically trying to communicate to the Jewish audience there and to us today that God has made such comforting, reassuring, hope-inspiring promises in his word that if we have faith in those promises, we will be content. And that contentment is the antidote to the love of money as well as contentment in satisfying our sexual desires that we won't feel the need to satisfy those sexual desires outside of God's plan. And while we have those promises that are also the antidote to sin, that our contentment in those promises is the antidote there, we also see that it's the fuel for loving the brethren for showing hospitality to strangers, loving those who are not like us, loving the mistreated and the prisoners, realizing that whether our things, our material possessions are destroyed, whether we lose our freedom here on earth, that we have a God ever present with us, that we have eternal rewards to come and we hold marriage in high honor because we understand the very mission statement that underlies what marriage is, displaying Christ's love for the church. And we get to serve God in such a way in that relationship and, and guard our sexuality so that when other people look at our life with all of these ways that our faith manifests itself in our life, other people will be able to see like in Matthew 5, like we saw that even though like we have this head knowledge of who God is and the faith and his promises, it spills out into our life and the light that shines through so that other people might see God and glorify him comes from each of these actions. So I want to close in prayer and, and then we'll sing a couple more songs. God, thank you so much for what you do to us, Lord what you have done for us, the fact that you are with us. Lord, that we get to hold on to the promises that you have made in your word, Lord, that in Jesus Christ, we are accepted by you. Lord, that we don't have to earn our salvation. We don't have to earn our value or our worthiness, Lord, that you choose to be with us. You choose to 
to love us regardless of, of our sinfulness, Lord. And I pray that everything that we know to be true about you, the promises that we know to be true, that as we hold fastly to them, as we exercise our faith, that you would create in us a, a desire to love in a way that reflects you, a desire to love one another, to love strangers, to love people who are mistreated for their faith, to um, love in marriage and keep ourselves sexually pure for the sake of others looking to our lives and glorifying you. God, I pray that, that we wouldn't be seeking any of that glory, Lord, but that we would be able to, when people look at us and ask us why we're different, Lord, that we would be able to point to you and point to your glory and the love that you have for us. God, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In Psalm 51, there's a really special dynamic that the psalmist um, expresses, and it's just this lengthy, um, heartfelt confession. Like, it's just, it's just this sort of part despair, um, part hopeful cry uh, for, for God to help, and um, when I, there are a couple of scriptures that speak to kind of the role of repentance and a couple of them in particular link repentance to the kindness of God. And it is phenomenal for me to imagine um, that in the heart of God, who is like the text says, a consuming fire, that he would have purposed from the beginning of time uh, to pour out kindness in order that we could be with him, that, or, or to pursue it to some of what Josh said, that he could be with us, right? Because he's the Holy One and we are not. And he said he promises this comfort. Um, and so that, that kindness, that he would go so far as to make a way for us to be together, and that that would, um, that, that would have this effect of spurning out good works, of this giving and going, uh, I find that to be an incredibly encouraging message, uh, and I hope that you do too. And so we picked a song now that comes from that Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart. O oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence, O oh Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within me. And so I hope that two things. One, uh, the, the wording of this comes from the Old Testament. And so there is a little bit of a uh, of a disparity between the message here and the message that you just heard. It says, take not your spirit from me, cast me not away from your presence. And so that those words came on the other side of the cross. And Jesus says, I will never leave you uh, or forsake you. He's fulfilling this prayer um, of, the, of the psalmist. Uh, so that's one thing. And the second thing is that um, Jesus has special things for you. And, um, and, and part of that is our confessing our need for him, our confessing our pride, our confessing of sin. And so whatever that is, um, I invite you to, to find that space with us as we sing. i 
God, as we as we prepare to finish this worship service and launch into uh, our week, uh, God, I pray that you would continue to teach us about um, teach us about repentance, teach us about how this this wonderful balance of both right knowing and right doing uh, both creates this foundation for our life, but is also this city on a hill. Um, and let us bear the light well, but not for our own gain. Uh, but, Father, for your glory, that people would see our good works and that they would glorify our Father in heaven. Amen. Well, join us as we finish with this, uh, this wonderful uh, declarative song. Water 
satisfy the thirsty without price will take the cup of kindness yet oh glory be to Christ sing all glory oh glory be to Christ our King invited uh, to journey with us that could start as soon as uh, maybe two minutes from now if you click the link if you're watching this live uh, down in the comments below you'll see us in the e-parlor uh, or that could be any way that you want to reach out to us um, or you know pretty soon we'll be uh, kind of laying out the plan for the next couple weeks and months uh, and so there will be lots of other times for us to connect and we want to journey together because we find that it's in community that we're able to do all of these things letting uh, letting familial wonder Wonderful brotherly love between the brothers and sisters. Let it continue and let us explore what that needs to look like as we face uncertain times. Um, but it's a beautiful thing and we get to do it together. So all glory be to Christ as we do it. Have a great week.